Amen. He'll take you through the fire again. Appreciate you being here this morning. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Appreciate all the nice compliments this morning on, on, on my suit. I uh, hadn't had this much excitement at Cornerstone since the hogs ate baby brother. Uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm just glad I was able to be a blessing to everybody today. Uh, my, my wife, uh, my wife, you know, she, she walks in in front of the deacon and says, I, I can't believe you wore that. But anyway, Mark, uh, I'm sorry for all the things I've said all these years to you, brother. I publicly apologize to you. Didn't realize what what everybody was doing, what we was doing to you. No wonder you're so beat down. You know, Hebrews chapter twelve, verse fourteen. Hebrews chapter twelve, verse fourteen. Uh, it, it doesn't happen a lot, but it, it happens every once in a while. You know, you study, prepare for a message, and and then uh, just just I'm telling you, an hour ago, God changed my mind and. This, uh, it's certainly unusual for me on Sunday morning just to get up and preach a sermon off the cuff. Uh, but I really, really, really felt impressed to preach on this subject today. Uh, believe it, because I, I believe when God does that, that, that means there's somebody in here that really needs to hear what he's got to say today. Amen. So I want you to pray for me today. You should always. But, Today I want you to pray because I believe God's wanting to do something in us. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. There's my text. James chapter 3 verse 11 says, Does the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Verse 14 says, But if ye have bitter envies and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. I want to talk to you this morning about the root of bitterness. The root of bitterness. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, we are thankful for the privilege of being here on this beautiful Sunday morning. And God, I, I guess I could say I wish it weren't the case that someone needed this, but I believe with all my heart that it is. In fact, God, as I begin to delve in the Scriptures, begin to run references, I... You spoke to my heart pretty clearly and pretty plainly about some things. So I pray, dear God, that as we start this message today, I pray this one thing. Would you talk to people on the inside while I talk to them on the outside? And if that'll happen today, if, if you'll just speak to their hearts, then something's getting ready to take place in this building that we need. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The root of bitterness. That's what it saved under Roger, the root of bitterness. First of all, I wanted to look at the germination of bitterness. How it starts, how it grows, the germination of bitterness. I found a scripture in Colossians 3, verse 19, where it said, Husbands... Love your wives and be not bitter against them. Now, I looked at that and I said, well, good night. Uh, a husband shouldn't ever feel bitter against his wife. But yet here it is in holy writ, so there must have been a reason for it to be there. He says, husbands, he said, uh, love your wives and be not bitter against them. And I've been married 40 years myself and 
I began to think about that. I, I mean, I've been married 40 years, and has any time that I've ever been bitter against my wife. And, and before I could even answer the question to myself or really get to asking it, the Holy Spirit of God spoke to me and said, Husband, you're to love your wife like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And then I began to think about, well, okay, what did she do to me to make me bitter against her? That, you know, that, that's the first, that's how our mind works. Isn't it? Okay, I'm trying to think back. I'm trying to get this sermon together. I mean, what did Karen do to make me bitter okay but then at the same time before I could finish that train of thought God spoke to my heart and says but yet what have you done to me see God is the husband and the church is the bride and yet he likens that relationship to marriage. He said he, that, that the husband's the head and the, the wife is the spouse just like the church is the spouse under God and then here's what God spoke to He said, well, good night. He said, how many times have you done things to me? How many times have you sinned against me? How many times have you done something wrong against me? And you knew it was wrong. I knew it was wrong. And, and, and yet he said, but I still love you and I still forgive you and I still hold you and I still, listen, and after all God's done for me, how can I be bitter against someone else? He says, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. This isn't a marriage cer ceremony today or preaching. The germination of bitterness. Well, the seed of bitterness. The seed where it all begins, it starts, uh, and as this germination process begins, the seed of bitterness is a hurt. It's a hurt. The hurt may be intentional. The hurt may be unintentional. Let's take that in for a minute. The seed of bitterness is a hurt. Now that hurt may be intentional, but that hurt may also have been unintentional. There's been times I've done things to people intentionally, but there's been also times that I didn't know that I'd even hurt somebody, didn't even realize. I mean, there's been times that I've hurt my wife and didn't even realize I'd hurt her. There's been times I've hurt other people and didn't realize I'd hurt them. The hurt was unintentional, but yet once again, the hurt was the hurt just the same. So the hurt may be intentional. The hurt may be unintentional. By the way, the hurt may be imagined. You need to write that down for your own self. The hurt may be imagined. It may, there may not even be. I mean, you say, well, that person hurt me, and really that there wasn't even nothing to be hurt about to start with. I mean, I could give all kinds of dumb illustrations about that, but I'm, I'm not going to do that this morning. I don't have time. But understand, that hurt may be intentional. It may be unintentional. The hurt may be imagined. It may not even exist. You just come up with something and got hurt. I was giving an illustration Wednesday night here that, that, that sometimes that you, uh, you know, if, if a guy's got bitterness in his heart, preacher can see two deacons out, out in the parking lot talking you know, at their car, and he immediately assumes that, hey, they're plotting against me. They're trying to do something against me. I mean, uh, they're, they're coming for me. And you know what? In all actuality, they may be out there talking about fishing or talking about the weather, or they may be talking about what a great message that was Sunday. So the hurt would have been imagined I don't want to get any more pointed than that but I think the Holy Spirit's able to get in your heart right now the hurt may be intentional it may be unintentional the hurt may be imagined and by the way the hurt the hurt may be God's chastisement Hebrews chapter 12 verse 5 says and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children my son despise not the chasing of the Lord nor faint when thou art rebuked of him for whom the Lord loveth he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth if you endure chastening by the way that word endure sounds like it, it might not be a very good thing that we're going through it says if you endure chastening God deal with you as sons for what son is he whom the father chasteneth not but if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our faith which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? 
For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. God wants us to be holy. God wants to be in his image. He said, now no chastening, verse 11 says, now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. No chastening for the present while you're getting the whooping. Never day doesn't seem to be nothing but good. And there's no, doesn't seem to be no joy in it. No chastening for the present seems to be joyful. But, but he said, I mean, I mean, this just makes sense as the writer's writing here. He said, but it's grievous. Oh, it hurts. It hurts and it's grievous. But nevertheless, afterward, there's the key word there. You ought to say it. Afterward, after the whooping, after the scourging, after God has to take his mother's nap in the neck, after God has to shake us, after God has to, has to whip us sometimes, after that he yielded the peaceful fruits of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. I preached a sermon not too long ago. I don't remember if it was here or somewhere else, but I preached on uh, uh, how that, that, that daddy used to whoop me when I was a kid. And I, I know we got DHS people here. How y'all doing? He's on the back row waving at me. But understand this. Daddy, I, I can see daddy getting me and, and, and listen, when, when I was raised up, when, when my daddy said do something, you did it. You didn't say but. You didn't say I don't have time. You did it. And if you didn't do it, you got a whooping. Not a whipping, a whooping. And here's why daddy did it. By the way, I'm not suggesting this, that, that this, this isn't a training ground for whooping kids. I'm giving you an illustration, okay? I'll cover myself here, give you an illustration. Daddy grabbed me by the arm, pulled his belt off. Daddy was talented. He's like a, music, uh, like a magician. He could do this with one hand, take off his belt. Undo it right here. Got me by the hand. Can I undo it with one hand and then jerk it? I can still remember the sound. That bolt coming out of his bucket. Now, by the way, as I've said a few times, I, I can't do that. It takes me a couple of hitches to get mine out because, and for you dumb people, that means that my, my waist is bigger around than my arm is long. Well, it's not funny. But Daddy grabbed me by the arm and he'd pull out that belt. Here he'd go. Daddy would start a whooping, and I'd start to run him. Daddy would whoop a while, I'd run a while. Daddy would whoop, that belt would get up there, boy, he'd hit you on the back of the leg. Whoa, man, lie. And you'd run, and I'd run. But then one day, while I was getting, here's the point. One day, while Daddy's a whooping and I was a running, I found out something. I'm out there as far as I can get away from him. And that belt is coming around, hitting the end of it, hitting my leg. But there in the middle of that whooping, I decided I just ran right toward Daddy. And I ran and I put my arms around, around his legs and just hung on to his legs. Well, he whooped there for a minute. I think he even hit his own leg a couple of times. And he sighed But I found out something that day. The best thing to do when you get in a whooping is not to run. The best thing to do is not to ball up your fist because that won't work. Let me tell you, that won't work. The best thing to do is just go as close as you can to the Father. Oh, you're a son and he loves you. And the reason why that you're under this chastisement this morning is because he loves you. Oh, how he loves you. He wants you to be better. He wants you to be conformed to his image. Oh, how he loves you. And if you'll just put your arms around him and get as close as you can to him and love him, oh, my friend, you'll find out that the chastening won't be as long. It won't be as harsh because when you do that, God is looking down and saying, I think he's finally got it. I think he's learned his lesson. I, I, I really think God looks down at us and says, hey, you know what? He loves me. That's all God's wanting to get about anyway is to get us to love him. The seed of bitterness is a hurt. The soil of bitterness 
is a heart that harbors hostility. You can't grow something in soil that ain't no good. And the only way that that, that seed of bitterness can grow is if it's placed in a heart that harbors hostility. The germination of bitterness. Well, now let's look at the devastation of bitterness. The devastation of bitterness. Hebrews 12, 15 says, Looking diligently, looking real close, he says, putting it under a microscope. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Lest, I want you to see that word, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Now the root of bitterness is underground. And something that's underground is easy to hide. I, th I thought that made sense when I wrote it down. A root is underground. It's easy to hide. He said, lest any root is underground, easy to hide, springing up trouble you. And many be defiled. In case I forget it, let me say this. You being bitter is not just affecting you. Your bitterness is going to affect a whole bunch. He said many be defiled because of your bitterness. Well, they did that. doesn't say anything about it. But, but, but they did this to me. They, they, they sinned against me. Well, you sinned against God too. Amen. Everybody, everybody here has. We've all broke his heart. We've all done things we shouldn't do. We've done it willfully. You said, I never had. Yeah, you had. You sinned willfully. You knew we wasn't not to do it. You know God didn't intend for you to do it. He hadn't done it anyway. But yet God still loves us and gives us opportunity. God wants us to be. And yes, he chased us yeah, because he loves us. But I want you to understand this, my friend. Let the, that the characteristics of a bit. Let me give you these real quick. The root's underground. You can't see it sometimes. Got it camouflaged. Got, got, and, and, and you, you think you do. But what's the characteristics of a bitter person? A bitter person is very sensitive. If you're bitter, got that root of bitterness covered up, it, you're very sensitive. A bitter person has little or no gratitude. You write that down. I want you to check yourself. A bitter person has little or no gratitude. The Bible says in the last days that there's going to be a crowd rise up that are unthankful, that are unholy. He said right before Jesus comes back, he said there's going to be people on this planet who are, he said the watchword of those people is they're going to be ungrateful. Are you ungrateful? Are you very sensitive? A bitter person will harshly criticize or vainly flatter. I think I've got something here if you'll let me get this out. A bitter person will harshly criticize or vainly flatter. A bitter person, number four, holds grudges. Y'all need to watch Frozen. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. 
A bitter person holds grudges. And a bitter person has mood swings. How you doing? A bitter person has mood swings. A lot of people that are being diagnosed with being bipolar are nothing more than have a problem with bitterness in their hearts. There's a lot of people in America being medicated with drugs. You say, Brother Lenton, are you a doctor? Well, yeah, by the way, I am. But, but, uh, but uh, you say, but Brother Lenton, that these people that, that are that you saying, I'm not preaching against medicine. I'm just saying that, that if you've got a heart problem, a drug ain't going to be able to solve your heart problem. Give you something to make you calm. I had a preacher that day come up to me and said, man, they've got me on this drug. It's got me settled down. He's trying to get me to take it. He said, you're going to die of a heart attack. You're so high strung. He's, he's been telling me that for 40 years. I'm still here. I'm fat and I'm still here. But medicine is not going to be able to solve a heart problem. Characteristics of a bitter person, very sensitive, has little or no gratitude, very, will, 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 will harshly criticize or vainly flatter, holds grudges, and has mood swings. The root of bitterness is underground and easy to hide. Well, let's look at the fruit of bitterness. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 says, Look him diligently, lest any root, and lest any man fail the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up, trouble you, trouble you, trouble you, and thereby many kids, grandkids, great grandkids, loved ones, cousins, church members, many be defiled. Many be defiled. I'm talking to some people here tonight, today. If you don't get this settled, your grandkids are going to pay for it. If you don't listen to the Holy Spirit this morning, I'm telling you, many are going to be defiled. I didn't write it, God wrote it. The fruit of bitterness, it will affect you physically. Bitterness will affect you physically. You can read in the psalmist uh, when there was a time in David's life when he was bitter, he was under the chastisement of God. We understand that. But he begins to, to catalog what's going on. Here he is, a middle-aged man that should have been at, at the height of his life, the height of his kingdom, yet he's walking around like an old man with arthritis and it's affected his joints. It's affected his cardiovascular system. It's affected everything about him. And he's limping around like an old man in his 90s when he's actually a middle-aged man that should have been strong and virile and, and leading the attack again for Israel but yet because of bitterness because he was under chastisement of God because of his own sin he got bitter because later we see him having to go to God and say oh God please deliver me from this it will affect you physically once again, we've got people taking medicine for stuff that, 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 that it's, a, it's a, not a physical thing, but it's turned into a physical thing, but it's a heart thing. It will affect you physically. It will also affect you emotionally. Amen. Proverbs chapter 15 says, Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. I've read that verse a hundred times. Reading through the book of Proverbs, you know, try, trying to do that monthly, but understand this. You know what that means there? He said it'd be better to sit down to a dinner of, of, of bitter weeds. It'd be better to, to that literally, one writer, I believe Matthew Henry says, uh, that it'd be better to sit down to some sheep shares that, that have been put in a pot and boiled. That's kind of a, a bitter weed that we used to eat when we was a kid. He said it'd be better to sit down and put some bitter weeds in a pot and with, where their love is and have, have a, a dinner of that than to sit down with a fatted ox. A fatted ox, one that'd been fattened out for the kill, that'd been grain-fed. 
He said it'd be better to have sheep sears with love than to have a big old T-bone steak where hatred and bitterness is. That's what it says. Pretty plain, you're right. It will affect you emotionally. But it'll also affect you spiritually. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Follow peace of all men and holiness with which no man shall see the Lord. Look in dinners, lest any man fail the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. It will affect you spiritually. How you doing this morning? Got bitterness in your heart? Say, Brother Linton. You ever been bitter against anybody? Yeah. Yeah, I have. But my mother used to say something that comes to my mind right now. She'd say, son, two wrongs don't make it right. Two wrongs don't make it right. What they done may have been wrong. But you being bitter don't make it right. Somebody may have done something to you. The old country and western, somebody done somebody wrong song. Somebody may have hurt you bad, hurt you deep. May have been intentional, may have been unintentional. I don't know. But I do know that it affects you spiritually, physically, emotionally. Bitterness is a chain reaction. We'll show you this. Ephesians 4 says, verse 26, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Verse 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. You've been authenticated. Then he says in verse 32, verse 31, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. You know why God forgives me? Because He loves His Son. And His Son died for me. Bitterness has a chain reaction. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor. James chapter 3 verse 6 tells you what this is. He said, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our member that it defiles the whole body and set it on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. I got under such deep conviction as I pasted this scripture on my notes. We need to all go back to the children's church. Sit out in a little chair. Because the Bible says, except you become like a little child, you can't inherit the kingdom of God. We need to sit down in our little chair and say, be careful, little mouth, what you speak. Be careful, little mouth, what you speak. There's a father up above looking down in tender love, so be careful, little mouth, what you speak. It's a chain reaction. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking turns into malice.
the devastation of bitterness. It's killing you. It's killing your relationship. It's killing your life. It happened, it happened, it happened. Okay, it happened. But don't let it kill you. I'm talking to somebody. I don't know who I'm talking to. Don't let it destroy your life. Please listen to God this morning. Don't let it eradicate your life. Oh, it's doing a number in your life, in your home, and it's not, it's a chain reaction. It's affecting your children and your grandchildren. Oh, my goodness. The devastation of bitterness. I look at people across this building today. If anybody in this building would have had a, a reason to be bitter, it would have been my wife back there. Horrible upraising. Her father was an atheist. Only thing she remembers about her mother, we were talking about this the other day, it's, she remembers the men coming in. Abuse of every sort. Godless home. Yeah, but you talk to her, you know what? She says God just had his hand on me all that time. Even when I was a little when somebody come by, they sent a bus by and picked her, picked her up on a Sunday school bus, went to church, heard about Jesus. Don't let bitterness destroy your life. I'm talking to somebody today. He's been bitter for years. And God sent you here this morning in this service to hear this message that God just gave me an hour ago. This bitterness that you're facing, what happened in your childhood, what your parents did to you, what your husband or your wife did to you, uh, I don't know what it was, but I'm telling you here today, it's devastating. If you let that bitterness take hold and it springs up, it's going to trouble your life. And it's going to defile a lot of people around you. And I want to get to the good part. I've talked to you today about the germination of bitterness. I've talked to you about the devastation of bitterness. But let me get to the good part. I want to talk to you about the eradication. <laughs> the eradication, getting rid of it, of bitterness. First of all, Look up here and listen. I'm going to help you right here. Hey, this is cheaper than a bottle of medicine. Won't even hurt your liver. Number one, let God reveal it. Let God reveal it. I'm bitter. Remember David? I was talking about a while ago, Psalm 139. Right in the middle of a bitter stage in his life, he says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Let God reveal it. That's what this service is all about this morning. Let God reveal you've got bitterness in your heart. It's going to hurt you and your family and generations to come. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to. But I, I, could, I can show families in this church. But I can go back to years ago and see bitterness in somebody a generation or two generations ago and I still see the effects of that bitterness in the grandkids and great-grandkids today. The eradication of bitterness. Let God reveal it. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The hearts of people above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? 
let God reveal it. Here in a few minutes, we're going to pray, and I'm going to ask God, the Holy Spirit, to go down your heart. And finally, maybe for the first time, you just out and say, God, I'm bitter. And bitterness isn't no little old mosquito bite. It's cancer. It's cancer. It'll destroy your life. But they, it'll destroy your life. But you don't know what they, but it'll destroy your life. Let God reveal it. You willing to do that this morning? You willing to say, God, search my heart? God, search my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. God, show it to me. I did that. You ever done that? You just go, okay, God. I don't see it. God, I want you to show. God, I want you to show me now. If, if if they're right and I'm wrong, I want you to show me. You ever done that? Well, once again, they may be wrong, but every time I've done that, God has showed me myself, and God all has always said, "But look what you've done. <laughs> look what you've done to me." Look what you've done against me. And they probably, God always says, and I promise you, Curtis, that, 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 that they hadn't done any semblance of what you've done to me. But yet I still love you. And Curtis, I'm not holding a grudge against you. Curtis, I still love you. I still want to use you. I still want to help you. I want us to walk together in fellowship. I want to, I want to spend eternity in heaven with you. Even though you've done it, you sin against me, but yet I still love you and I want you. Glory to God. Let God reveal it. Number two, let grace remove it. <laughs> let God reveal it, but let grace remove it. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. What does that say? My goodness, I've read it a thousand times. That if I've let bitterness creep into my soul, I'm failing the grace of God. I'm not letting grace work in my life. Christ has become no effect. I mean, hey, I don't like the way that sounds. Let grace remove it. Look in the dentist, lest any man fail the grace of God. Lest any root or bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Let God reveal it. Let grace remove it. And let good replace it. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Follow peace with all men, and holding us without which no man shall see the Lord. Ephesians 2, 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Conclusion. Are you bitter? Everybody look up here. Are you bitter? Against who? God? Somebody here bitter against God? God, I can't believe you let that happen to me. God, I can't believe... You bitter against God? Job had a little... If you, if you read Job in the middle part of Job, you, you, you see that, that Job was starting to develop some of this and, and, and he caught it before it turned into bitterness. And he kind of changed. Right? He said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Now some of you are starting to swell up on me right now. We're almost done. Don't you listen to me. Who are you bitter against? 
You better against God? Hey, who you better against? You, you, you better against your spouse? But Brother Linton, you don't know what they've done. But no, but I know what you've done. All we like sheep have gone astray. All of sin has come short of the glory of God. Every last one of us have sinned. All of us. But Brother Linton, you just don't understand what they do. Yeah. Uh, are you bitter against your spouse? It's going to affect you, kids your grandkids, and everybody around you. Well, I didn't say nothing. You don't have to. They can see it the way you walk. They can hear the inflection in your voice. They can see it in your eyes and in your actions. Are you bitter against another Christian? Answer me. Are you bitter against somebody that, that's a part of the family of God? Somebody that God loves just as much as He loves you? Amen. God loves the, the person you're bitter against just as much as He loves you? The old Indian said, you know, don't judge a fellow you walked a mile in his moccasins. If you're bitter against somebody in this church, this church is never going to be what it should be and could be for God. Many be defiled. If I'm bitter against Mark Yandel, it's going to affect the Linton family, the Hanson family, the Wilson family, and it's going to affect all the Andales. It's going to affect Mark, Sharon. It's going to affect y'all. Y'all live in couch. It's going to affect you. It's going to affect that kid there. It's going to affect you. Many be defiled. Who are you bitter against? God, your spouse. Another Christian, the church. A lot of people are bitter against the church. The church is comprised of people. People mess up. Yeah. By the way, sometimes, by the way, sometimes I found out that it's not the church that messed up. It's because they just didn't do what you wanted them to do. Wasn't nobody trying to hurt nobody. Wasn't nobody trying to get nobody. Wasn't nobody trying to destroy anybody. I mean, r r really, it's just because people are people. People have opinions. Everybody's got, you know, armpits and opinions, and sometimes they stink. Are you bitter against life? Let me tell you something. God had never done nothing but good. Best things of the song, he ain't ever done nothing but good. Nothing but good. So what am I bitter about? It's time to let God pull up the root. You don't need to come down here and weed eat it. We need to let God pull up the root. Get it all the way up. It'll let any root of bitterness. Because, see, if we weed eat that dude, if the root's still there, it'll, still, it'll come back. Amen. Pull it up. Pull it up. That's what this altar's for tonight. That's what this altar's for. Amen. It's time to let God pull up this root. It'll take over your life. It'll destroy you and a whole bunch of other people. Job 3.20 says, Wherefore is light given to them that is in misery and life, life unto the bitter of soul. God wants you to have life and wants you to have it more abundantly. But that can't happen if you got bitterness in your soul. Let's pray.